Welcome everyone. Uh, welcome our uh, interview sessions from World Talent Economy Forums. So uh, around the world, many of the challenging issues now happening and people try to solve this kind of challenge. So uh, those who are trying to solve uh, these challenges, we always welcome them. So Mr. Gangiti is that kind of person who try to take responsibility as well as uh, uh, try to introduce new solutions and new policy, new discussions with uh, uh, different countries and he tried to build a better ecosystem around the world. So welcome, Mr. Gandhi. Uh, Gandhi. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Sharif. I appreciate being invited to speak with you today. Uh, 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 thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you please, for our audience, can you please introduce uh, yourself and your activities, uh, how you work and how you develop your philosophy? Certainly. Uh, so. My name is Janati Stolyarov II. I am the chairman of the United States Transhumanist Party. I have been the chairman of the US Transhumanist Party since November 2016. And as an organization, the US Transhumanist Party seeks to put science, health, and technology at the forefront of American politics. But even beyond American politics, we seek to advance the philosophy and the applications of transhumanism, which is the idea that humankind should use science and technology and rationality to overcome its historic limitations, including the most severe limitations of all, which are death and disease. So I am here in order to champion these goals. The US Transhumanist Party is an organization that welcomes members from all over the world and collaboration with individuals who seek to use science and technology to improve the human condition. Mm, very interesting. Uh, you are talking about transhumanism. So what is actually transhumanism? Uh, how it comes, uh, how it works? Uh, can you explain for, with our audience, please? Yes. So essentially transhumanism is about overcoming the limits of humanity through science and technology. Since humankind came to be, uh, we have been woefully limited by death and disease and material scarcity and also a tendency toward conflict with our fellow human beings. We have limited minds. We have limited processing capability within our minds. And over time, humans have developed tools to at least partially address some of these problems. But of course, many of them are still with us today. And the difference between the previous eras of human history, where humans did utilize technology extensively, and today is that the extent of technological advancement has become such that we actually stand on the cusp of solving these problems. There have been advances in our understanding of human biology and in medical treatments and genome sequencing and biotechnology in nanotechnology that could actually overcome diseases that were previously thought to be incurable and could also reverse the process of biological aging within our cells leading to open-ended lifespans likewise there have been great advances in information technology exponential growth in computer processing capability as famously articulated by Gordon Moore in Moore's Law. And this exponential growth in processing ability enables the solutions to problems that would have been too computationally intensive in the past. So that could lead to increasingly sophisticated algorithms. Right now, they are what could be called narrow artificial intelligence. So they're specialized to solving problems in particular domains. But in the future, we may have artificial general intelligence, which could uh, essentially move across domains and provide really creative, innovative solutions to some of the problems where human brain power as it currently exists may not be sufficient. But also transhumanism, promises a future of human enhancement where our own minds 
will improve in their capabilities, both through biological augmentations and artificial augmentations, integrations with our computer devices. So imagine having a mind with the individuality and the creative capability of a human, but also the instantaneous recall of a computer and the ability to upload massive amounts of information with perfect fidelity uh, as computers can do today. If we combine those capabilities, uh, humans will be able to achieve great things and save themselves a lot of time that is currently spent uh, learning information, integrating information. And then of course we have to be concerned about our external world, about how do we manage our infrastructure? So transhumanism has some powerful ideas for greatly improving and building up our infrastructure, for clean energy, uh, for addressing the effects of climate change, for space colonization, and making sure that we become a multi-planetary species, for uh, innovative methods of agriculture, including vertical farming and genetic engineering to make sure that we're able to grow more food, but grow it in a more sustainable fashion and perhaps even use less land to do it. And transhumanists are also interested in automation, robotics, autonomous vehicles, uh, habitats of various innovative kinds, not just on land, but also on the sea floor with ocean colonies or on the surface of the oceans with seasteads, uh, which are modular platforms. So transhumanism seeks to push the frontiers of technological advancement in every direction where there are promising benefits to human well-being. And what transhumanists hold is that this is the solution to a lot of the conflicts and crises and problems that people face today. So if someone today is poor or sick or uh, feels that uh, the world is difficult or there's a loss of meaning, there's an ability to recover from that. There's an ability to build a better world, which will be also a great boon to that individual as well as his or her fellow humans. Okay, very interesting. Uh, and uh, you are trying to make a global uh, connections and global relations around the world. In that particular specific uh, uh, relationship in between global countries and global peoples, uh, do you uh, making a, a relationship might like real contributions with the developing economy? This is my first question. And second question is that I'm from developing countries. So even uh, uh, for my uh, research and my work, I get chance to involve and integrate it with the first world in Europe and USA. So from my perspective, uh, I find that um, like you are coming up with a different aspects of uh, technology, modern science and different things. Uh, in developing economy, uh, uh, there are different aspects, different environment. Let's say you are talking about artificial intelligence, you are talking, you know, talking about AI. And um, even in, in developing nations, uh, they have a lot of challenges, especially people feeling threat that if automation comes, I may lose my job. Uh, and there are huge amount of people, still they are not uh, getting involved in this kind of things or they do not train themselves Properly, yes, government trying to take a lot of initiative, but because of bureaucracy and a lot of things, still it's not come up with a very good result. So as you are representing a modern world, how you can change this kind of huge amount of underprivileged people, how you can change their life, how you can contribute their life, because as you are a uh, 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 come up with a political party, so you have to care about people. What's your thoughts? What's your point of view? Do you do a lot of research? I, I come up with uh, uh, many questions, but this is one of the maybe interest, interesting agenda for your uh, philosophical aspects or for your political party. What do you think? Yes, indeed. Well, I think the countries of the developing world stand to benefit the most from the ideas of transhumanism because applying these ideas and the emerging technologies that we advocate is the best chance for the developing world 
not just to catch up with the most economically prosperous countries right now, but to surpass those countries. So as an example, consider cell phones. Cell phones used to be a luxury of the extremely rich in the United States 30 years ago. So in 1990, if you saw someone in the United States walking uh, outside with this large brick uh, made of plastic, it was kind of clunky, uh, had very poor reception. But if you saw a person walking around with that device, chances are that person would have been a millionaire because only millionaires could afford these devices. But right now, many people in underprivileged parts of the world are able to have access to cheap <laughs> mobile phones that have much more functionality than these millionaire cell phones had 30 years ago. So someone who is a subsistence farmer who may live in a neighborhood where the water quality is poor, uh, who may have other issues that he's struggling with, would still have access to that cell phone. And that cell phone is going to help him lead a better life. It's going to help him, for instance, find where he can sell his goods uh, for a better price. It's going to help him coordinate with his family uh, if there's an emergency uh, or maybe find some other opportunities uh, to improve his lot economically. And that's an example of how technology can really transform the lives of the least fortunate most of all. But I think the story actually goes beyond that because right now in the Western world, there's a lot of old obsolete infrastructure. For instance, in the United States, a lot of our roads were built in the 1950s. A lot of our electrical grid and our gas pipelines, for example, were constructed even earlier than that. There are many cities in the United States where much of the housing stock is from the early 20th century. And there are various restrictions on development and uh, cultural aversions to change in the Western world that prevent this situation from being remedied as quickly as it should be. There are some gradual efforts here and there, but the pace of progress isn't as fast as it could be. But let's say we go to a developing country where there isn't as much of that legacy infrastructure, but these new technologies become available cheaply and people can deploy them and people can construct the infrastructure around them, which will end up being a lot more modern, a lot more functional, a lot easier uh, for people to use to bring about the benefits of a comfortable standard of living. So of course, there has to be a concerted push to do that. And there has to be good governance to do that. If you have a corrupt regime, for instance, or, or if you have a lot of fears or superstitions getting in the way, uh, that's going to create problems. But uh, I am gradually connecting with people all over the world and having these conversations, just like the conversation I'm having with you right now, and trying to provide some insights that could be applied with a bit of creativity. For example, in April, uh, I participated at a conference uh, of an organization that has an extensive presence in Nigeria. It's called TAFFDS, the uh, Transdisciplinary Agora for Future Discussions. And uh, I am quite fond of this organization because its participants are trying to build these international collaborations. So they've reached out to the US Transhumanist Party, they've reached out to other groups in the United States, and they've invited us to a variety of forums where we can uh, talk about these issues that can ultimately lift up uh, countries in the developing world. So I gave a presentation there about how Africa could defeat COVID-19 and at the same time improve its infrastructure so dramatically that it could rise into a position of global leadership in science and technology, in medicine. Uh, and I think there's a lot of receptiveness to that because while in the Western world, a lot of people have become very comfortable with their existing standard of living, but they've also become cynical and they've become disillusioned about the prospect of technological change because they don't realize what life is like without adequate infrastructure, what life is like without the continual application of the fruits of science and technology. But people in the developing world are very aware of just how bad life can be without these 
tools without these methodical approaches to improve it. So this is an audience that I think we can reach with the transhumanist message and convince them that not only is this relevant to them, but if they apply this way of thinking and if they develop these technologies, uh, also adapt technologies from the Western world, but certainly take charge and take the leadership in these areas, then these countries will have a bright future. And, and their people who are very motivated are going to be at the forefront of global change and innovation. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's, it's, it's really interesting. Uh, let's say I, I just want to focus on the present situations. Uh, now in the COVID-19 situations, uh, people have major challenges with economy. Okay, many people lose their job, many organizations and uh, manufacturing industry, they shut down, step by step they are trying to reopen it. Uh, but still, uh, there are a lot of challenges. A lot of people have a lot of uh, problems. Even different country, but uh, I want to share one, one thing that Malaysia in that situation, they are playing a very good role with the help of local peoples as well as the governments. Uh, if you see the death rate of Malaysia is not so high, I think 118 people died, uh, but uh, there are not too much of people affected in that situation. But there are other countries, South Asia and Asia Pacific countries, uh, they, are, they have a lot of challenges and problems. So what do you think? What do you think about the healthcare system? What do you think in terms of your point of view, uh, how we can uh, develop more uh, like effective healthcare system for this kind of people. Even uh, uh, these people, they do not have uh, even social security, enough social security. Even they do not have enough healthcare ins uh, insurance. Many challenges actually. And in that situation, they are fighting with COVID-19. I saw they have a lot of pain. You cannot imagine practically how they are facing these things. How, how you find out the solution for these people? What your objective? As you are a political party, you are representing something new. You are taking care of human beings. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I will say, uh, based on your description of Malaysia's response, Malaysia has handled COVID-19 extremely well compared to a lot of Western countries, compared to the United States, compared to France or the United Kingdom or Spain or Italy, Malaysia has definitely done a better job. And this is evident in the results, but it also speaks to the fact that the world is changing, that some of the preconceptions that people have had about which healthcare systems work better uh, have turned out to be false when those systems were tested. And I think sometimes it's important to consider what is substance versus what is illusion in a healthcare system. So just because a system is very expensive, for instance, uh, or has a lot of uh, let's say, bureaucratic procedures involved with it doesn't mean that it's a good system. Sometimes a good system is one that is simpler, but provides a more rapid response, a more streamlined response, makes sure that the basics are available. And in the United States, we've had uh, terrible problems with the basics being available. Our medical practitioners have had a lack of basic personal protective equipment like masks. We've had a shortage of ventilators. We've had too limited hospital capacity, especially in the most intense zones for the pandemic. So the US Transhumanist Party has been quite concerned about this and has advocated for placing investments in healthcare and healthcare infrastructure at the forefront of our priorities. For instance, we have advocated an initiative for rapid hospital construction in the United States. Uh, and this was motivated by several hospitals that were built within days in China, in Wuhan, to deal with the initial outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the techniques are already there. The materials to create these hospitals rapidly already exist. It's a matter of the will to do it and the recognition that having this capacity and having infrastructure that is resilient against disruptions to the supply chain, as well as the available stockpile of goods, it's crucial. So other initiatives that need to be undertaken would be 
the creation of national stockpiles and special warehouses of essential medical goods, including personal protective equipment, first aid kits, uh, even uh, we've proposed for more severe pandemics having hazmat suits in stock that could be distributed to the population if a virus that is deadlier than COVID-19 breaks out. Furthermore, we need significantly more investment in research into disease cures and vaccines. So right now, commendably, the United States has accelerated a lot of the research and development efforts for a COVID-19 vaccine. I still think that it's too slow, but at least they are trying to get a vaccine approved before the end of the year. Previously, it would have taken maybe four to five years, if that, to develop an effective vaccine because of the cumbersome restrictions associated with uh, what one needs to test for, the many layers of efficacy testing uh, that need to be gone through in order for uh, people to even be allowed to uh, purchase a treatment or uh, be volunteers in receiving it. So clearly when you have a rapidly uh, evolving pandemic situation, that's not fast enough. And uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, would die, millions of people would be exposed before this approval process could conclude. So having more rapid approval processes, having more resources devoted into research is absolutely crucial. But there's also a key component to overcoming infectious disease, which is often not recognized in mainstream conversations. And that is the need to overcome biological aging. Because if one looks at the mortalities uh, from COVID-19, so the median age of death is in the 80s. And people who are past the age of 60 are far more susceptible to this disease and the adverse consequences of it than younger individuals. Indeed, if everybody had the biological youthfulness of a 25-year-old, it's true, some would still have had some adverse consequences from COVID-19. But it would not be a national emergency. It would not be a global emergency. There would be no economic shutdowns. Uh, there would be uh, perhaps some enhanced healthcare measures, but largely day-to-day -day life would proceed unchanged. So aging, aging makes people vulnerable to so many diseases. And that includes your typical seasonal influenza. The elderly are uh, often by far the greatest share of victims. Uh, an elderly person can even withstand the common cold a lot less well than a young person. And of course, with chronic diseases like diabetes, cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, all of those conditions disproportionately and sometimes exclusively befall the elderly. So more fundamental research efforts to cure and reverse biological aging are needed in order to avoid these kinds of problems. And hopefully governments will start to recognize that, the private sector uh, will start to recognize that, that if we are to avoid massive disruptions to our economies, to our societies, to our quality of life, we need not only to uh, defeat this particular virus, we need to prevent future pandemics by accelerating research into rejuvenation biotechnology. Okay. okay. Uh, I want to come up with some uh, real real life example. Even if you follow World Talent Economic Forum, you find that we, we come up with a very interesting guest in our forum because we want to change human life. Uh, let's say I want to give a specific example, uh, Mr. Akpo Choudhury. Even he is a philosopher and very successful uh, 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 businessman from Bangladesh. Uh, transcom food industry he growing in Bangladesh even he was a very big uh, organizer for liberation wire liberation wire museum and other things even three years before uh, uh, suddenly we find he quit from everything and he goes to Himalaya and he said how actually Western world they are integrating with our economy our economy will not survive Yes, I agree. Even in my lifetime, I saw that, let's say, Grameen phone with the help of Telenor company, how they change lives. Bikash, 
with mobile uh, money transferring, how they change human life, economic systems, they are contributing in more. But this kind of big corporate house, as he representing, as well as he move and he goes to Himalaya, he say, we have to take care of the green ecosystems. We have to take care of the sustainabilities, uh, but too much of interventions uh, in our agriculture, in our healthcare systems, in our uh, total ecosystem. If a Western world come up with this different different solutions, uh, then uh, our natural ecosystem uh, cannot survive. Let's say uh, I'm from Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, we have variety of fish. Okay, variety of fish. People actually dependence on rice and fish, but when actually a uh, uh, Western world come up with a different kind of fish and other things, our ag agro-based systems, uh, uh, they change. Uh, we have to change the, uh, our ecosystem and other things. How do you think, how do you think these kind of perceptions, like there are just still there are contributions, which we find there are many good changes, as well as we find uh, there are many challenges we cannot, uh, like uh, solving right now. So as you are thinking in the global perspective and you are talking about uh, uh, science and technology, uh, do you not think like uh, like uh, developing uh, like developed nations also take some uh, sort of good things in their economy? Let's say microfinance, let's say Islamic finance, uh, this kind of uh, brilliant things. Uh, in, in their uh, uh, research, in their philosophy, in their aspects. And by this way, we can create more knowledgeable ecosystem. Otherwise, uh, do you, you do not think it's only one sided. It's not uh, fully uh, like uh, what, 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 what can I say? I can say that it's not a fully uh, proper ecosystem. What do you think? What's your perceptions? Well, uh, I agree with you that a lot of the innovations for this kind of future that I'm promoting should originate in the developing countries and should be tailored to the needs of the people in those countries. And that's ultimately where the entrepreneurs, the scientists, the policy thinkers in those countries are going to have awareness of the context and the circumstances to a greater extent than someone from outside of those countries would. So uh, the economic models you mentioned, uh, I hope they could even spread to the Western world, like microfinance can mm -hmm. be quite helpful for someone who is just starting a small business, for example, and doesn't want to get a huge loan, but might want to get a loan of a few hundred dollars uh, just for starting equipment. That's not uh, just a problem unique to uh, say Bangladesh or mm -hmm. Malaysia. Uh, there are people in the United States in those circumstances as well. And I wish the infrastructure for those existed. So very much I believe that people in these countries should be innovators who not just apply the ideas locally, but also broadcast them out to the rest of the world so that uh, mm -hmm. we in the Western world can also think about these ideas and consider what their beneficial applications would be. But also, I think it's important to recognize the Earth's carrying capacity is not finite. It's a function of what we know and mm -hmm. our technological ability. So something that is, for instance, a pollutant or a useful uh, item in one era could be a valuable resource in the next era. And as an example, I'll bring uh, oil into the conversation. So oil for the vast majority of human history used to be treated as a waste product because people didn't know what to do with it. And if a farmer had oil underneath his land, well, crops would not grow uh, on that land. So sometimes the farmers would engage in efforts to actively get rid of that oil, but they didn't know of any beneficial uses. So in the 19th century, that changed. And entrepreneurs, uh, for example, John D. Rockefeller in the United States, figured out ways to use oil for heating first. And then, of course, oil began to be used uh, as fuel for vehicles. And while one might think today, well, oil uh, still can be a pollutant, it can cause adverse environmental effects, keep in mind what it replaced. In transportation, it replaced the horse and buggy and horses generate immense quantities of manure, which were 
tremendous public health hazards in cities all over the world. So by replacing manure with oil, uh, one actually greatly improved air quality and greatly reduced the transmission of diseases. So now we have a situation where uh, there are some side effects of oil that we need to overcome. And what is the best way to overcome them? It's through more technological innovation. So electric vehicles uh, are a great example of that. Uh, alternative energy sources, solar energy, uh, safe nuclear power, geothermal energy. Uh, those are just some examples, but more sources will be developed over time. And the key is with every generation of technological advancement, there are problems that are solved. There are also some side effects, but generally on net, the amount of benefit greatly exceeds the risks and dangers, which is why right now the carrying capacity of the earth is a lot greater than it was, say, during the Paleolithic era, uh, when the earth could only sustain maybe 3 million people. And right now we actually have more food than there is population on earth. Uh, we have enough food for about 10 billion people uh, as compared to 8 billion living in the world today. But there are problems with infrastructure. So there could be issues sometimes with delivering enough food to where people need it. There could be issues with governance if there is a corrupt regime or a regime that wants to withhold food in order to exert power over its people. That's a problem that needs to be overcome. But in terms of technological abundance, I think if we get the governance right, if we apply rationality to the improvement of human well-being, then the carrying capacity of the earth and the amount of available resources for us is only going to increase. And also it's important to keep in mind if we start sustainably colonizing space, if we start extracting resources from asteroids, if we start uh, founding bases on other planets, all of those are endeavors that are going to bring more resources to earth as well. Uh, to be used to improve human well-being. So I think the path forward in overcoming environmental concerns is definitely a technological path. Uh, and I emphasize to people who think that any previous era was better, that it was not. In most human history, the vast majority of people starved. And most people did not live past the age of 30 anywhere in the world up until about the year 1850. But what's fascinating is, so in 1850, average life expectancy in most of the world was around 30. Right now, there's no continent in the world where the average life expectancy is below the age of 60. Even in Africa, where it is lowest right now, in 2018, it was around 62. Uh, but the improvements in life expectancy have actually been accelerating in Africa since the year 2000. And everywhere else, in every other continent now, average life expectancy is above 70 years. So what that tells us is, even though there are still many problems in the world, technology has helped us tremendously to live lives of greater length and greater quality and greater hope for the future. Okay, I, I, I want to focus on different challenges as well right now. As you are running a political party and you are working with the most progressive people, in recent years, let's say, there are one thing we find Islamophobia. Okay, like even example, uh, uh, as I have a chance to integrate it with different country, different university, different cultures. So when I come to Malaysia, I find that here, women are very progressive. They're wearing hijab. Uh, even my PhD research and other things on that particular point, they are wearing hijab as well as they are highly educated. Even they are teaching in the university, doing research, they are driving cars, and there are many, many uh, progressive thinkers, contributors, and uh, uh, great scholars in the Islamic uh, community. And Islamic peoples, uh, uh, like those who are uh, religious, uh, like, they, are, they are actually really peaceful. They love peaceful, they have a peaceful mind. Even in recent years, you cannot find that Malaysia have any problems. Uh, and But on the other hand, from the Western world, we find that uh, they are uh, trying to impose that Islam has 
fundamentalist they have this problem that problem these issues but practically maybe 90 percent it's not true so uh, what your political aspect as you are integrating with the global community because recent years there is a huge challenges the relationship even in the muslim world and the u.s context what do you think what what should be your strategy on that particular point or your political party has specific strategy for this uh, islamophobia and these things so the u.s transhumanist party explicitly welcomes people of all religious and cultural backgrounds or lack of religion so uh, mm -hmm. for example I myself am not a religious person, but I don't want to convince other people to be atheists. That's not my goal. My goal is to find ways in this world to collaborate with others, no matter what they think about whether there's another life after this one or what that is like, because we all share the same reality here and we all deal with the same issues essentially here. And I think it's really important to find understanding, to find common ground with people of a variety of religious persuasions. And there are Muslim members of the US Transhumanist Party. There are Muslim thinkers with whom uh, we have communicated uh, throughout the world. And uh, I agree with your characterization of these individuals as being peaceful and as being progressive. I think within every group, there are some people who are peaceful and progressive, and there is some uh, other segment of people who are inclined toward intolerance and dogmatism and violence. Uh, that's certainly the case within Christianity. That's the case among uh, some atheists as well. And I think the reason why that is so does not relate to the specific theology of that religion. Mm -hmm it relates to the mindsets of the individuals who are involved. Uh, mm -hmm. And the more I interact with people, the more I uh, create connections with people, uh, the more I realize that there's a certain distribution of personality traits that exists in every society and every group of people. And it may be that they're manifest differently because of different uh, external circumstances, different political or economic or social realities that people have to contend with. But uh, you have some people who are inclined toward peace and tolerance and cooperation, and you have others who are antisocial and who want to destroy or who want to dominate. And I think for a transhumanist, it's important to consider why that is and how we can structure human interactions so that the peaceful members of every group are the ones who predominate and the ones who set the terms, essentially. Uh, so you did mention fundamentalists. Uh, my observation is a lot of Islamic fundamentalists come from very troubled parts of the world, areas that have been affected by a lot of warfare, dictatorship, uh, a lot of material scarcity, and they're offering a very simplistic ways out of that to a population that uh, sees very limited ways out. So the only reason why these fundamentalists can flourish or why, why any kind of destructive radical group can flourish is because they're telling people, you have a difficult life and we have an easy way for you to solve that. And, and that's an alluring promise, but it's a very deceptive promise because if your solution is violence, you're not going to uh, get anywhere good. Uh, you're only going to exacerbate the problem. So. I think the solution has to be improving human living standards sufficiently and doing it in a way that collaborates across national lines, across religious and political divides, so that we realize maybe most of us have more in common than what divides us. And we have so many shared goals that we could collaborate toward. And in the future, of course, how people will view their 
religions, their customs, their traditions is going to interact with all of the changes in the world. So I would say uh, people who consider themselves Christians today, uh, the actual content of their beliefs is very different from uh, people who consider themselves Christians in the third century. And likewise, I would say people who consider themselves Muslims today may have very different beliefs from some Muslims in the seventh or eighth century. And in some parts of the world, they may have different beliefs from people who call themselves Muslims in other parts of the world, just as uh, I am an atheist, but there are many atheists who would disagree with everything I just said, uh, and yet they would still call themselves atheists. Uh, so uh, I really think getting to understand people as individuals, what their worldview is, what they think, how they live their lives, uh, that is uh, tremendously important. Uh, and this is why the U.S. Transhumanist Party is so open to individuals from a variety of perspectives, because we do value them as people. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, at present situation, we find there are some challenges like U.S.-China relationship, China-India relationship. Side by side, we are facing a huge challenges with COVID-19, economical situations. How do you think about these issues? How we can solve these issues? Uh, what's your perspective? Yes, I think the only way to truly defeat COVID-19 is if all of humankind realizes we are on the same side in the fight against this disease. So right now, it is absolutely futile to blame China or blame uh, any other country uh, and escalate tensions when what we should be doing is one understanding what happened and to understand what happened it's necessary to communicate and also to learn the lessons of those who have dealt with this disease and that doesn't mean we have to do the same thing that they did so in china the initial response uh first was to kind of downplay the existence of COVID-19. But then once the officials recognized this is a problem that is not going to disappear on its own, they imposed an extremely strict lockdown on the city of Wuhan. Sometimes they neglected the human rights of the individuals there. Uh, and their approach, it had some very positive effects. It had some very negative effects. But in terms of the positive effects, they did manage to contain a lot of the death toll from Wuhan. Uh, so what can we, uh, who are looking at this situation uh, from the outside, uh, derive from that? Well, I would say we need to take whatever it is that was beneficial, but also be respectful of human rights and also uh, consider where the government of China may have overreacted and imposed limits that were unnecessary for the people. Uh, but there were a lot of innovations that I think other countries would do well to adopt. For instance, the rapid hospital construction that I discussed earlier. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's important right now to at least not escalate geopolitical tensions while this disease is in progress. I believe all wars, all trade conflicts, all forms of diplomatic tensions need to be uh, put in suspense at the very least, uh, because any flare up along these lines is going to accelerate the spread of the novel coronavirus. And instead, there need to be open lines of communication, whether we agree or disagree with uh, the policies of a particular government, information sharing is crucial for everybody's benefit. And I really think this could be the start of more sustained collaborations if governments all over the world recognize that there are some higher stakes here than whatever resentments or national rivalries may have been in play before. Yes, uh, I want to give you more challenges. We want some clarification. Let's say when a new political party come in the forums or in the uh, like sunshine, uh, they come with many good commitments. They come with the many good idea. They come with the many uh, uh, interesting idea. And uh, uh, and after that, people start to trust them. Then they achieve their objective. 
somehow they come to the powers and many things. Then what they committed to their people, they cannot maintain and they cannot fulfill. So how, let's say, much people can trust Transhumanist Party? Yes, your political aspect is very good. Yes, your philosophy is very good. Yes, how you working, uh, how you involving with the uh, around the world and they're trying to help people. This is really interesting. But ultimately, we uh, people, much people, they are always they are uh, facing these challenges. When new people come, new team come, they come up with many good commitments. But after that, they fail to fulfill their commitments in for many issues. How we can trust transhumanist? How we can make a better understanding about transhumanist? What do you think? Yes, and that is indeed a challenging question because it speaks to the fact that humans are fallible, that humans may have good intentions, but humans also have flaws. Uh, those flaws are the result of our evolutionary origins and the fact that our minds evolved to exist in this paleolithic uh, context where people lived in tribes of about 150 people and they had certain in-group loyalties to their tribe, but they were very suspicious and fearful of others. And those who try to transcend that world, who try to act in a way that's better, in a way that's more inclusive, in a way that better reflects uh, our contemporary technological and interconnected reality, they also have to struggle against these evolved mindsets, these evolved tendencies that are not necessarily uh, best suited for our world. I would say that for transhumanists, as we grow in our movement, as we grow in influence, our best safeguard against this kind of tendency to fail to fulfill our promise would be the innovative application of technology and rational processes in order to kind of check some of these uh, human tendencies that you mentioned. So for example, uh, the electoral system in the United mm -hmm. States is quite flawed right now. And mm -hmm. we see a lot of manifestations of bad behavior uh, through that system with the Republicans and Democrats in the United States engaging in this partisan toxicity and sometimes using uh, very extreme and damaging tactics just to win an election. Uh, but fundamentally, structurally, why is that the case? It's the case in part because of how the voting system in the United States is configured. It's a winner take all uh, or first past the post system, which uh, naturally tends to encourage polarization into two sides. Uh, and then those two sides uh, become locked in this endless combat. So instead of the first past the post system, in practice, the US Transhumanist Party and its internal votes uses a ranked preference system where uh, the voter can rank order all of the alternatives so they don't have to be worried about uh, essentially what happens if they prefer a choice that is not likely to win, but they really want to stop some other particular alternative from winning. Uh, and in most uh, political systems in the Western world, this uh, plurality voting or first past the post uh, system really encourages people to vote for the so-called lesser evil. So if we can design structures, if we can design incentives that prevent this kind of uh, negative strategic thinking uh, on the part of people, then we can get to better outcomes within the political process. But it also does take integrity. It takes commitment to rationality. It takes commitment to transcending these uh, built-in biases within mm -hmm. our mind. And I think technology can help in that as well. Uh, certainly uh, with online education, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. if people spend more of their time online instead mm -hmm. of uh, the frivolous uses of social media, we sometimes see in uh, more structured learning environments where they're uh, acquiring information, they're engaged in creative projects, they're collaborating with people from all over the world, that could help. Uh, and ultimately in the future, 
as human minds get integrated with technology to a greater extent, we might have this technology provide more direct aid. So let's say uh, there's a computer integration with the brain and all of a sudden you have the contents of Wikipedia uh, available to you in your mind and you still have the same critical faculty. So you could accept or reject those contents, but uh, you don't have to go on a machine to browse Wikipedia anymore. Instead, whenever somebody talks to you about a historical event or uh, a particular figure or a country, you have all of the background information that you can access instantly like that. And how is that going to change your thinking? How is that going to change your capacity to fulfill your promises? And, and that's another thing. Uh, with technology, a lot of the older human limitations can be overcome. So if I want to engage in a project right now that I think will be beneficial, it will take some time and effort. And maybe I'll be able to do it, but maybe I will have some other circumstances in my life that will prevent me from doing it as effectively as I could. But with technology, if I can do more in less time and do it more effectively and with higher quality, uh, I might overcome that bottleneck too. So uh, I'm fully aware of the risks that you mentioned, but I also think there's some hope in overcoming those risks. At the very least, uh, I don't see any option except to try. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, this is good, but uh, uh, if we focus on the developing nation's economy, let's say India, Pakistan, Bangladesh. So uh, we find, let's say, uh, they have garments industry, they have different kind of manufacturing industry. But when this pandemic come, because they, uh, they, they have to export the, uh, like their clothes and many things from uh, uh, subcontinent to USA, Europe and other things. But this, when this pandemic come, so um, every business uh, they have to uh, downsize and they have to even uh, all many people actually losing their jobs. Many people actually uh, uh, in that situation, they cannot survive. Even I can give you uh, information. Let's say it's, it's actually developing nations information. Like those who live in capitals, now they are moving from their capitals to their village because they, are, they cannot survive. They cannot survive in that situations. So, but, but you are trying to imposing technology. Uh, already many, many people in this COVID-19 periods losing job practically. Fast world, uh, uh, yes, they are trying to help, but in many uh, issues, uh, people actually suffering a lot, suffering a lot. Still you, you think that, do you think you need to do some research, real life industrial research and other things how you can integrate it with these human lives? Uh, what do you think? What's your perception? Or practically, you visited these kind of countries, or you integrated with this kind of industry, uh, and uh, you have a specific data information right now. What's going on in these developing nations? Uh, what what will the future? Because I, uh, from my perspective, even what I understand, how I see these situations, millions of people are suffering right now. Things are not so easy, like imposing technology. And let's say I want to give you a very specific case study. Uh, waste management, the modern things, and definitely we have to do it. So I do not, for this India, I do not want to mention a specific country, but I can mention the case as well. So when I go to in, uh, implement this uh, 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 waste management system in a big city, so that time I find if I impose this waste management system, 3,000 family, those who actually uh, lose their job. Why? Because actually they are collecting wastes from different house and by this way they are earning money. Okay, but if we integrated this, uh, this kind of new technology, 3,000 family will lose job and it's a great political impact as well as it's a uh, financial impact. So uh, th then that time I have to quit from this strategy because, because uh, like, like I cannot create something which is not actually practical, which is not actually uh, uh, life uh, uh, like life oriented, economic oriented. Yes, I definitely agree. Your mobile phone example, uh, mobile money transferring issues, even a few of the what you said in agriculture issues is 
uh, uh, changing side by side. Actually, healthcare systems. Uh, I want I want to say except Malaysia, Vietnam, Hong Kong, this kind of country, China. Uh, most of the countries uh, they are facing challenges. What do you think actually? What do you think? You you do not think you need to do more integrated with real life scenario or real life challenges. I'm I'm trying. Do not trying to give you any listen. I'm just trying to give you guess what's going right. on. Yes. So I think it's instructive to consider which industries mm -hmm. and which types of work have been affected by COVID nineteen the most, and mm -hmm. which people have been more insulated from it. And in the Western world, it's very clear. The people who have been most insulated from COVID-19 are the knowledge workers, the people with portable skill sets who can potentially do their jobs from anywhere, especially if they have a reliable internet connection. And mm -hmm. those people are able to keep earning incomes. The people who have suffered the most are the people who have to interact in close proximity with others. So if you're working in a factory or if you're working in uh, a restaurant, uh, for example, uh, it's a lot more likely that you would face economic disruptions as opposed to if you were working in an office before, uh, but now you're working from your home, from your computer now. Uh, so what enabled so many people to have that ability to be knowledge workers. It's a certain level of economic advancement. So historically, in less developed countries, the vast majority of people had to work in agriculture because there weren't the technologies for more efficient agricultural production. And uh, also in less developed forms of agriculture, you had more people crowded together in order to, for instance, harvest uh, crops from the field. Whereas right now in agriculture, you could have uh, single individuals and tractors, or you could have robots uh, doing the harvesting. So with your example with waste management, uh, I would actually like to see uh, the situation move in the opposite direction from these individuals collecting waste and potentially spreading disease. I would like to see the whole system automated so that only robots would engage in waste management. I would like to see all taxis automated so that if somebody wants to travel uh, to a certain location, they don't have to get into a car with a driver. They could call forth an autonomous vehicle and that vehicle would transport them. Now, those people who were previously employed in those professions, they are going to have to find new lines of work. But the objective productive capacity of that society will have increased so that you would have robots doing the more routine things, uh, the more repetitive tasks, both in terms of uh, physical goods production and extraction, as well as in terms of, say, more routine data processing, uh, repetitive tasks that don't require creativity or judgment. But that will increase the overall amount of resources produced, and that will free up the time and efforts of the humans to focus on the higher order, more creative tasks. The ideal society from this standpoint is where everyone is a knowledge worker, where everyone is a creative worker, so that if a pandemic comes, we can all afford to stay at home and continue to do our jobs, and the robots will deliver us the food. Uh, they will keep our production and our infrastructure going. We could control them remotely. Uh, we could still design new machines. We can still engage in the arts and the sciences uh, and literature and actually have a lot more free time. Uh, so that is the transhumanist future where work increasingly will become less about fulfilling the basic necessities of life, but rather more about maintaining this advanced automated infrastructure, as well as improving the opportunities for humans to enjoy their time, enrich themselves intellectually, culturally. That's the kind of world that we want to be in. And think about it from even the perspective of the person who's collecting waste right now. What sort of life is that? Uh, it's a, a very uncomfortable life uh, for those people. They're going outside uh, and uh, they are uh, harvesting the byproducts of others. Uh, surely they can't enjoy that. 
they don't feel a sense of inner fulfillment from it, what if they could become engineers or scientists or computer programmers in the near term and in the more distant term even have enough resources to uh, devote to whatever creative endeavor they wish. So that's the promise. There will be transitions. People will need to re-educate themselves. It's not going to happen mm -hmm. overnight. There should be some systems in society to protect people against uh, temporary disruptions. So the US Transhumanist Party supports a universal basic income. If someone has lost a job due to automation, they should still have some sort of unconditional payment that they receive, which ideally should be funded through natural resource extraction so that there's no extra taxation on other people uh, from it. But this idea of a universal basic income is that everyone should get it, no matter what their socioeconomic status, whether they're employed or not, so that there is this basic floor uh, of a standard of living below which they cannot fall. And that way people don't have to be so invested in their current jobs. Uh, they don't have to think, well, what if I lose this job as a waste collector, then what will happen to me? Instead, they can think, well, I've lost this job as a waste collector. Hmm, that wasn't such a good job to begin with, but I want to do something better with my time now. So mm -hmm. I have this floor, I'm getting some money, I'm going to study now. I'm going to re-specialize in a career and maybe I won't have to leave my home anymore if it's a pandemic. Uh, instead, I could contribute my knowledge. So that's hopefully the direction in which the world will go. There does need to be the political will to provide that kind of universal basic income. And uh, I would add uh, better education. Uh, we have so many opportunities for remote mm -hmm. learning now. I think everybody should be taking advantage of these opportunities and thinking, what will happen if my current skill set is no longer in demand? How can I stay relevant? How can I continue to contribute my time and my efforts in a productive way? Mm -hmm. uh, sir, I, I take one hour from you, but it's a very interesting discussion. Can we continue a few more minutes? What, what yes, certainly. Okay. Okay. Uh, sir, there is an audience response. I think he's a, uh, his name is Mr. Vlad Wimbo. He said, outstanding reply. He appreciate your approach. And he said, remember, democracy never lasts long. It soon west uh, exhausts and uh, murder itself. Anyway, this is his perspective. He's trying to explain about the democratic uh, present situations. Uh, I just want to focus on your dissolutions like educations what you are talking about, even I, I personally see that you are uh, like from transhumanism, you are trying to contribute even in Africa uh, uh, with, with different kind of uh, online educations and other things. How uh, with these better solutions, what you are talking, I'm really interested about to know about the education system and how we can work on that, uh, that uh, with better solution, how we can reach these people uh, to develop their skill set, their knowledge base set. Uh, like that is actually World Talent Economy Forum, actually our objective. When we find there are many challenges, we need to go with the solutions. How we can do this work? How we can um, taking uh, some support from uh, from your side or, or from your party about this uh, human resource development? Yes, uh, and that's a great question. I would say you're already doing a lot of this right now. And we're doing this uh, right this instant and having this conversation in addressing these kinds of challenging questions in a way that is engaging to our audience. So hopefully the people watching this are learning about some new ideas, some new possibilities. And this needs to be ongoing as a kind of series of decentralized conversations and collaborations that need to be spread widely online. Uh, we need to continue building these bridges across countries, uh, across perspectives, across institutions. And right now, so many people are in a situation where they have no choice but to engage in remote learning uh, because no other uh, learning possibilities are available. They can't just go to a school or a university if those are closed down. So now is the time to develop innovative course structures and to experiment with those. One idea along these lines is gamification. Uh, we've seen, of course, how games are extremely 
addictive to a lot of people. They spend many hours of their time playing video games, playing computer games, even various rudimentary games on social media where you click on a few things on a screen and maybe you build a farm or you build a village uh, or a castle. Uh, those can be engaging to a lot of people. What if you took those game elements and you combined them with learning rewards for internalizing specific concepts or completing certain projects that have real world applications? Uh, if you learn, uh, for instance, how to do an integral uh, of a particular kind, you can get points in that game. And then you could use those points uh, for uh, various rewards or opportunities within the game. So that is one possibility. Another possibility is uh, distributed credentials. Uh, there was a project in the early 2010s called Open Badges. It was spearheaded by Mozilla, which is the same organization that uh, operates the Firefox browser. But the idea of Open Badges was that you could have people, uh, teachers or organizations throughout the world who have certain courses or certain requirements uh, that one can complete to get this certification called an open badge, which could then be shared across platforms and recognized by other institutions, by other organizations. One of the issues with education historically has been that it has been so siloed in specific institutions. So if you go to a certain university, you're expected to stay there, you're expected to complete uh, a course of study that would last for multiple years. And sometimes you could transfer your credits to another university, but it would be a cumbersome process and it won't succeed all the time. What if instead of having these credentials that are so tied to specific institutions, they could be uh, more decentralized in the sense that you could earn a credential from any of a number of providers by objectively demonstrating your knowledge or your achievement in a certain field. And that would drive down the cost of education too, because right now a lot of the costs of getting a university degree, uh, for instance, are the costs of that infrastructure uh, of essentially devoting several years of your life to going to some other place and living there and uh, essentially paying a lot of people uh, for in-person learning when a lot of that could be scaled. Uh, so you could have uh, open courseware uh, that many of the great universities in the United States have offered where you can listen to lectures by some of their best professors and the contents of those lectures are going to stay the same. Uh, and then you could have an interactive component where you have assignments where you do interact with people who review your work, who grade your work, and who certify that you have passed. But there are other automatic uh, types of evaluations. If you take a quiz in an online interface, you don't necessarily have to have a human grading it in the vast majority of instances, unless there's an error uh, the computer could tell you whether you passed or failed. So there are so many efficiencies to be gained through online learning that can greatly lower the cost. And at the same time, I think it's also a question of mindset. So uh, traditionally, a lot of people thought, well, I'm going to go to school now, I'm going to learn uh, for a certain period of time, and then I'll be finished. And then I can just work uh, at whatever specialty I have learned and earn money until I retire. Uh, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, the world has become a lot more dynamic. The pace of change has greatly accelerated. So people need to be lifelong learners. They need to continue acquiring new skills. They need to continue to keep up with developments in the world, especially because certain jobs are going to become obsolete and perhaps better jobs will come around to replace them, but people have to be ready. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, this is very interesting uh, objective you have. So World Talent Economy Forums, we are working on this. So any of your assistant, if you want to offer any course, if you want to offer online degrees, or if you want to help these people, we are working not only in Malaysia, uh, we are working with Malaysia, in the, uh, like Indonesia, this Asia Pacific, as well as in South Asia, even already many of the institution, many of the policy makers, many government, they all request us if we have any good solutions 
for developing human resources we can offer. So we are very open to you. We are very open on this offer because this is the solution. We are not only discussing on problem, we are trying to fix this problem. So this is our one thing. I know you are expending a lot of time. One more question, if you allow me from the audience, can I take or? Yes, yeah. certainly. Okay, uh, Mr. Tizze was, he said, how does Gennady feel about investing in industrial M for food, fuel, fiber, and the 10,000 other product with agriculture to create renewable energy, uh, plastic, anyway, uh, like he, I, I think he want to know about uh, the hemp, uh, how, mm -hmm. how people can invest on hemp and these things. Yes. Yes. So the U.S. Transhumanist Party, first of all, fully supports legalizing industrial hemp. It is really strange that uh, actually manufacturing it or distributing it was against the law in the United States for a long time. And thankfully, now that's becoming relaxed and hopefully it will be relaxed more consistently going forward. Uh, but yes, uh, Mr. Wass is completely correct. There are applications to industrial hemp in a variety of manufacturing and agricultural processes that should be explored and taken advantage of. And certainly uh, we're completely supportive of the freedom to do that and any policy reforms that make it easier to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, this is the last question. What's the three uh, strategy you will advise uh, uh, to our community uh, in present situations we can take to solve this uh, COVID-19 situation, both in economicals and the healthcare system. What's your, what you try to advise the uh, different countries and their corporations and their NGOs and the government as well? Yes, so uh, first of all, this is, uh, an area where the U.S. Transhumanist Party has had extensive deliberations. In fact, we have uh, platform planks that were adopted specifically to address COVID-19 responses. Uh, those who are interested should go to our website at transhumanist-party.org slash platform and then go to the section on COVID-19 responses. And uh, these are uh, a multitude of suggestions ranging from section 98 of our platform to then uh, section 118. Uh, so uh, you, you can clearly see uh, we have a lot of ideas. Uh, one of them is the rapid hospital construction that I mentioned. Another is a, a universal basic income to tide people over from the uh, severe adverse economic impacts of becoming involuntarily unemployed due to a variety of economic disruptions. Another solution is to, uh, for the United States, recall its military from the overseas and have the military provide uh, assistance in terms of building the infrastructure, providing humanitarian relief to uh, COVID-19 patients. Most importantly, we need to invest massive amounts of funding and research effort into developing cures and vaccines for COVID-19, as well as other infectious diseases, while simultaneously greatly increasing the funding for anti-aging research. Because as I mentioned before, aging is the number one risk factor for COVID-19. And we have a variety of other suggestions as well. Uh, for instance, creating uh, international collaboration networks uh, and ways to rapidly distribute supplies as well as expertise uh, across national boundaries, creating stockpiles of essential goods, uh, reforming education systems uh, to make sure that people are more prepared for pandemics, that uh, they study historical pandemics and can anticipate uh, how uh, to help uh, minimize their spread. And then we also, as I mentioned, want to accelerate approval processes. So in the United States, there have been severe delays because of the requirements of the Food and Drug Administration. And we would like to replace this Food and Drug Administration with what we call a Radical Life Extension Administration, which would still uh, require testing for safety of 
medications and other treatments, but would focus on the rapid development of potential disease cures, treatments, and vaccines. And instead of holding progress back, would be a motive force for accelerating that progress. So these are uh, some of the ideas that I have outlined. There are various others. Again, uh, if you go to transhumanist-party.org slash platform to the section on COVID-19 responses, uh, these are uh, sections 98 through 118 of our platform, 21 proposals and all. Mm -hmm. uh, this is really, really interesting discussions. And in the future, we want to arrange more policy discussion. We want to arrange debate. We, we want to arrange more summit. So if you allow, uh, allow me, then I, I can invite you and your teams. Then we can do more integrated. Even we do a lot of research. And uh, industry, we have engagement. So any of the format, you and your party or your expert team, because uh, we, uh, we want to more engage with more knowledge-based people. So if we engage with them, maybe we can create more winning strategy and we can ultimately achieve our objective. Thank you for your time and thank you for your effort. It's a really, really, really very valuable discussion for World Talent Economy Forums. And definitely we want to arrange this kind of session more. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Thank you for uh, speaking with me today. I enjoyed our conversation, found it quite thought provoking. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.